Good morning. Before we get too far into 2019, let's look back with a perfectly clear view of last year and who and what made a significant impact on the state of Michigan. Picking the WXYZ Channel 7 Newsmaker of the Year is never easy. The diverse list of candidates comes from the world of sports, the political arena, community organizers, and the business community. But one individual rose above the crowded field of finalists to capture our attention the most. His name and claim to fame? Bill Ford Jr., executive chairman of the Ford Motor Company. Michigan Central Station has a new owner, Ford Motor Company. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is our Newsmaker of the Year special. It's Sunday, January the 27th, and this is Spotlight. Let's reflect back a little bit on 2018. Big year, lots of media attention, but what was it that made Bill Ford Jr. say, okay, we're gonna purchase a building that's over 100 years old, it's been sitting for decades, and you know what? It's gonna be a good return on our investment. Well, you know, it's a couple things, Chuck. First of all, um, I was so sick of driving by that train station uh, every week and being reminded that it was being as, uh, used as the poster child for everything that was wrong with Detroit. I hated that. Every time you'd see an out-of-town story about the decay of Detroit, the visual was off in the train station. So I hated that. So I started to say to myself, well, what if? And then I started to really get going. Um, and then I you know, had to have a few people uh, around me do a little bit of a sanity check to say, you know, am I crazy to think this way? But the reality is, look, we're in a war for talent. Um, and we have to create the workplace of tomorrow uh, that's really interesting and compelling for people to be at. And I could make the case that a renovated train station, there'll be nothing like it anywhere in the country. And then, on top of that, to be creating our autonomous driving teams there, blending the very best of the old with the very best of the new, it'll be really cool. Uh, my father had left here to go to Vietnam, and uh, he described to me years ago about coming through the walkways and all the, the big yard out front and the vendors out front and, and coming in and saying farewell to his family and jumping on a train and heading off. We come from Las Vegas where if anything's more than 25 years old, they blow it up and they build something new that doesn't look like anything else. But I mean, this this building looks like the rest of the downtown Detroit. And so to fix it up, hopefully that'll you know infuse uh, energy. I'm originally from Mississippi. I when I was 12 years old, every summer I came to Detroit on the, the Michigan Central train station. And it really shows the resilience of Detroit. The, the train station coming back is the comeback of Detroit. Mr. Ford, this was the best idea I have heard of in a very long time. And thank you so much for believing in this building in the city. You, you can see the glory time of Detroit from that station. I'm just excited because this marks the first time where the whole renaissance of Detroit that we've seen happening downtown, it starts to flourish into the neighborhoods. I mean, that train station has been an eyesore. It is it, literally a symbol worldwide of the decay of Detroit. So to flip that around and turn it into not just a nice building again, but the hub of all this uh, autonomy and mobility going on, I, I really commend the Ford Motor Company, especially Bill Ford, for having the guts and the vision to say, this is what we're going to do. The Ford name has always been synonymous with Detroit, and there's always been a link to history, whether it was your great-grandfather or it was Greenfield Village. In your raising, what is it that made history so instilled in you, your family, and the Ford name? Well, I think it's impossible to be in our family and not be appreciative of history. I mean, you know, so much, I have fortunate both my families. I had Harvey Firestone on my mother's side and Henry Ford on my father's side. So, you know, I really uh, was steeped in history from really the day I was born. Um, and then you add on top of it uh, the fact that Corktown uh, was settled by the Irish that came from County Cork, which is exactly where my relatives came from. Um, and they settled in Dearborn, not, not in, in Corktown. But it was the same time, the same people coming over. That also, to me, was really interesting. Back in 1960, then President John F. Kennedy said, 
We celebrate the past to awaken the future. Is that what you're trying to do with the purchase of the train depot? Well, I do, because uh, Detroit was once the greatest city in the country, if not the world. And I love the way it's coming back. But what, one of the great things is we have such beautiful buildings in Detroit. Uh, and the train station is perhaps the most beautiful. So, you know, four years from now, when it's restored, vibrant, and people are coming from all over to see it, to me, that's really interesting. But if all we did was just restore the past, that would be really neat, but we can do so much more. We can actually create the whole transportation system of tomorrow uh, in Corktown. And to me, that's really blending the best of the past with what's to come. This seems to just be the latest move from the Ford family reconnecting with the city of Detroit. But you know, when I think back, and I don't know if you recall, uh, the side-by-side -side stadium deal. I mean, I was, you know, involved in that every step of the way, uh, including I would go to the churches on Sunday and talk about the need for the new stadium, the hotel, motel rent a car tax. Uh, that was a really interesting time. And I got advice from some very prominent business people said, don't go to the city, It'd be the worst mistake you could ever make. Your fans won't feel safe. You won't get police coverage there. Um, there's nothing to do before and after the game. Don't do it. Uh, but that struck me as just wrong. Uh, and fortunately, it was wrong. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I went back and I looked at the interview we did way back in 1996 at the Silver Dome. And let me show you what you said then. Why is it so important that you move back to the city? Well, I think it's, you know, it, it, all of us believe, and I certainly believe, you know, wholeheartedly, that unless Detroit is viable and vibrant, the quality of life in this entire metro region is greatly diminished. And um, I think for a long time, a lot of people felt, well, we'll just move to the suburbs and everything will be fine. Um, and that's clearly not the case. Anybody, you know, who spent time in Chicago or New York or even Cleveland or Pittsburgh knows that a healthy city center is absolutely vital to the to the health and the and the fun of the entire region. Yeah, and I'm happy to say, you know, here we are all these years later and the city is made, is making remarkable progress. Still a lot to do, for sure, but I love the fact that the national conversation is completely changed now when we talk about Detroit. I mean, it's, it's kind of makes me smile. People say, oh, you're from Detroit, the new Brooklyn. Uh, and I kind of go, no, I'm from Detroit and, and it's Detroit. It's not the new anything. Um, but I love the fact that our image is changing uh, nationally and internationally. We've gone, you know, from an image of one of decay and crime and, you know, flight to the suburbs and bad school systems and all that to one of, wow, Detroit is a happening place. It's cool. It's interesting. Yes, there's still issues that have to be dealt with, just like any city in the country. But we're making progress, and I think it's great. When this Newsmaker special returns, Bill Ford will talk about the mobility future. The visual attraction is the train station, but it's really much more than that. Talk a little bit about your vision for that 1.2 million square feet campus that you're going to build in Corktown. Yeah, I mean, so you're, you're, I'm glad you mentioned that because it is much more than just the train station. I mean, we have multiple buildings down there. We have land down there. But the one thing I don't want this to be is a, seen as a corporate takeover of the neighborhood. We are spending tons of time in the neighborhood talking to individuals, businesses, community groups, uh, saying, what would you like to see us do and what don't you want to see us do? Uh, because I think it's really important, at least it is for me, that we're seen as part of the community, not as some big corporation that's coming in and taking over the community. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fantastic when it's all finished. The hope is to have as much of the original property of this iconic Michigan Central Station returned. Ford says they've already received dozens of calls. We thought it was going to be big. We knew it was going to be big, but never like this, right? I never thought I'd be getting phone calls from everybody offering to help and it's just a really great feeling. 
A great feeling knowing that there's so much interest in bringing the Michigan Central Station back to life. Last month, an anonymous caller told Ford where to find a decades old clock that once hung at the old train depot. And since that news, many others have called saying they too have pieces of this history. Several people have called and they were offering lighting back. We had other people that have called and they've got a fountain from the station. Or somebody called and there's some medallion with flowers on it that's from the depot. So all sorts of things, everything you can possibly imagine. Mobility, that's what you've been talking a lot about. Autonomous cars, electric vehicles. Uh, but where is all of this going? It seems as though automakers are saying, we aren't real sure, but we know we've got to be there just in case it really takes off. Well, look, there's no question that our industry is changing right before our eyes. Uh, you, know, you, you know, a few years ago, you didn't have Uber, you didn't have Lyft. Um, you know, you didn't have, um, Zipcar and other, other fractional model of ownership, um, and you know, and, and all the technology that's going into the cars that you're seeing today. I'm not talking about tomorrow, but even today, uh, tremendous amount of technology, and it, so it's all changing. Artificial intelligence is 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 starting to change the way our whole business is, is being run and the way the vehicles will be run. So I do believe that in the future, our vehicles will be very smart. They'll be connected to the cloud and they'll be talking not only to other vehicles, but to the cities around them. Um, and ultimately, I think there's going to be uh, something called the transportation cloud, where everything in the city is talking to each other. The trains, the bicycles, the scooters, the pedestrians, the cars, all to allow things to move freely in the city. Because the biggest issue city, cities have today is they're already jam-packed. And you know, traffic jams are terrible. We have to find a way to free that up and to let people move and let healthcare, uh, people get to doctors and have food be able to be moved around cities. And so it's a big problem, but I think we'll solve it. How important will partnerships be as you move forward with the auto industry? You just did a deal with Volkswagen. It was met with mixed reviews. Stock went down. But I remember you years ago saying, if you don't take risk, nothing good will ever become of it. I think the biggest risk is doing nothing, Chuck. I mean, is uh, the biggest risk is putting our head in the sand and say the world is today like it was five years ago and we're going to be just fine. The reality is the world that you and I have just been talking about is coming and it's going to be very expensive. We don't know the time frame. Uh, you know, it could be shorter, it could be longer. It's going to take enormous uh, capital, not just money, although a lot of that too, but human talent, uh, geographic distribution. So you're going to see, I believe, lots of partnerships, not just with auto, one automaker and another, but tech companies and autos, startups and autos, lots of tradition, uh, traditional and non-traditional partnerships, are, I think are going to be the norm rather than the exception. Coming up, Bill Ford Jr. on attracting America's top talent. I remember a conversation you and I had a few years ago about saying, are we going to let Silicon Valley take all of this, and why should they? It should happen here, and you, you made it happen, so thank you. Right before Governor Snyder left office, he got his Marshall Plan for talent through. He felt it was one of the most important things he did during his eight-year administration. How well do you think we are positioned in this city and state to attract the top talent for the future? Well, that's why it's so important that the city continues to uh, come back and reinvent itself because, you know, five years ago when we were recruiting, you know, talent from overseas, from California, from New York, you'd say, come to southeastern Michigan, and they'd think, mm, do I really want to do that? Now, with Detroit, you know, becoming a hot property, it's much easier to get talent to consider coming here, and that's hugely important. So, um, but it's also important that our homegrown talent be good and educated. And you know, one of the things we have in this state are great universities, uh, and I love that because. And not only are they great universities, they're universities that are used to working with companies, and that's not always the case. So, you know, whether it's Wayne State, Michigan State, you know, obviously University of Michigan, you know, and you can go on and on and on. Uh, all of them uh, do a great job of educating our students and 
they also work really well with the big corporations. And so I, th I think it gives Michigan, the state of Michigan, a huge advantage over a lot of other states. The job cuts at this plant will be happening during the first quarter of next year. The workers got the word from their union, the United Auto Workers Union. It's part of our business. I mean, that's what uh, happens in the auto business. Yeah. I've been through it at Utica and it's uh, happening again. Take a look at the banner on the outside of this plant that proudly states this was the assembly plan of this year. Ford in a statement says these moves are to rebalance production to match capacity with customer demand. Are you affected by this? Uh, I think we'll all be affected somehow. How many are in the plant? I, at one time I think there was 1,300. Ford is making it clear that the 230 workers laid off here will be offered new jobs in other plants. And some say this cycle could continue next year with a possible recession and possibly more auto cuts. What are your concerns? Oh, well, I'm going to retire soon, so just my brothers and sisters in there. They always have options for you here. It's been a great place. I've become actually kind of numb to it. That's this way uh, you make money and then uh, it goes down. People buy cars and uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's just part of the process. The other cuts are 25 temporary part-time employees over in Dearborn. Ford says those workers have already been cut and already been offered new jobs. In Sterling Heights, Jim Kurtz. 7 Action News. You get to sit in the boardroom making tough decisions in a global economy where all sorts of things can change, sometimes just with the drop of a tweet. <laughs> How do you do that, and what is it you think consumers want now and in the future? Well, you know, of course, that's always the, the, uh, the art of this industry is trying to figure out what they want in the future. And there's so many things that go into that, not only changing tastes, but fuel prices, regulations, all those things that you know, ultimately come to bear in the product. Um, in my mind, there's no question that electrification is here to stay and we have to all go you know, flat out after electrification because if you look at the fuel economy targets around the world, there's really, with the technology we have today, electrification is the best route to go. Uh, the big question is, will the customers be there? And you know, that's the great unknown. Uh, so, uh, but that's a trend that'll happen for sure. We're seeing also the silhouettes of our cars changing from tra traditional sedans to more high, you know, higher cube, whether you want to call them crossovers or SUVs. Um, and people say, well, why is that? Well, they're just more usable space. That's why. Uh, I don't think there's anything really much more complicated than that. So, um, could, will those silhouettes continue to evolve? Yes. I also think you'll see the advent of uh, city vehicles. Today, you're already starting to see scooters in cities. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're everywhere. And people love them. They, that, they get them those last few blocks or that last mile, and, and I think that's great. But Detroit in January, um, you know, riding a scooter isn't the most uh, comfortable thing. So maybe that'll evolve into something covering a scooter. I mean, I think there are a lot of things yet to be invented that we'll start to see in, in cities first, frankly. Automation, electric cars, they're already coming. And with that comes a shift in jobs, something auto expert John McElroy tells me has been quietly brewing behind the scenes for years. So people really haven't noticed that much of a change. Now they're starting to sit up and take notice. And in the next decade, by 2030, the rate of change is going to be extraordinarily rapid. So you've got to start getting ready right now. So how do you prep for those jobs? While the news of the auto industry reductions hurts, the reality is the industry won't disappear. The cars of tomorrow are still going to be built here. Batteries, electric motors, some of that work is already based in Michigan. But if you're a parent, that means pushing kids in a new direction. So if you have any skill set that's got anything to do with electronics, electricity, batteries, mobility, coding, should I say coding three times? You gotta learn how to code. You've got a bright future in front of you. Next on this Newsmaker Special, the Ford Chairman talks about corporate responsibility of our environment.
This 60 page report from Environment Michigan explains how industrial facilities dumped what they call an excessive amount of pollution in the state's waterways nearly 200 times in the past two years. Pollutants were being added to waters that were already too polluted for uses such as swimming, drinking, and fishing. And what should the corporate responsibility be to our environment? Something you've talked about making the world a lot greener. Well, it's hugely important. I mean, I, I think, you know, our, our world is, and it's talked about a lot and for good reason, facing, you know, a climate change issue. And it's not just autos. I think everybody who lives on this planet has an obligation, but uh, we have to do our share too. So it's, but it's not just the cars. Uh, it's how they're made. It's our supply chain. And we're driving change through all of those. I mean, one of the big initiatives we have which we don't talk a lot about, but I'm very proud of, is our water usage. We've cut our water usage by over 70% in the last 10 years. Um, why? But most people don't realize that traditionally manufacturing's used a lot of water. Well, we're changing that equation uh, and making manufacturing a much more efficient process. Same thing with hazardous chemicals. We're getting them out of our, our uh, manufacturing process. Again, we don't talk a lot about that. So, the cars and trucks themselves have to get clean, and so do the way we make them. You've been chairman of the board for 20 years, you've been on the board for about 30 years, and you've been with the company for about 40 years. As you reflect back, what do you remember as the real highlights of your term as chairman? You know, Chuck, it's, it's always the people. Um, you know, when I think back of what I have enjoyed most, uh, what I think, you know, I'm most proud of, it's mentoring uh, some of the people along the way. It's uh, providing leadership for a group. Most importantly, it's uh, providing the corporate values, uh, the ethics and the, uh, the, the feeling of family that we have in Ford. Uh, I love that. And to me, yeah, I could point to lots of great products that we had. I could point to great financial years that we've had. I could point to all those things, and I'd be proud of all that. I could point to a lot of mistakes I've made, too wouldn't be so proud of that uh, but <laughs> but you know but but overall it always comes for me comes back to the people that I've worked with uh, and that's what I'll always remember I, mean, I, I love the company but it's really because I love the people Bill Ford Jr. congratulations on being our 2018 WXYZ Channel 7 newsmaker of the year an honor thank you thank you so much so there you have a special thanks to Bill Ford Jr. the Ford Motor Company and the North American International Auto Show I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.